Hey guys, my name is Echo Kellum. I play Curtis Hall, aka Miss Terrific, on CW Arrow, and you're listening to Neil Before Pod. Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. Hello and welcome to another edition of Neil Before Pod, the only podcast rich in rare earth elements. After our long discussion on Pacific Rim, we're now here to bring you a discussion of its sequel, Pacific Rim Uprising. Back for another round of Monsters v. Robots is Kat. Hello. Hello. How are things? Very good, thank you. I just came back from the cinema. I just watched Pacific Rim 2, so everything is very fresh. Um, I have a lot of emotions, uh, so let's unpack them while they're... <laughs> while they're bubbling up. Is it is it fresh yet fading <laughs> by any chance? <laughs> well, we'll we'll discuss this. We'll, we'll, see, um, we'll, see. we'll discuss this a little we'll bit. We'll see if yeah. you even remember having seen the film by the end of the podcast. See how quickly it leaves. <laughs> <laughs> so, without spoiling, what did you think of it? Worthy sequel, rubbish sequel, okay, somewhere in between. Um, I thought I mean, it wasn't nearly as iconic as the original, but as a sequel, I thought it was solid. I thought it builded on the story and kind of the the mythology of the world quite nicely. Um, It introduced some really interesting new characters. We saw some familiar faces turn turn up again. Um, The storyline is, once again, completely ridiculous, but it makes sense in-universe, and so that's fine. Um, it felt very 2018. Uh, not always in a bad way. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't mean to trash it by saying this. Um, there's some dated memes which feel slightly out of place, um, particularly in the context of this is an alternate version of our world. And so to, to imply that these memes exist in the Pacific Rim, kind of world um is is a bit jarring i I wasn't sure what to make of it um but we'll we'll get to that later um they do add to the tone of the film there's an element of comedy that's stronger i think um the demographic definitely skews younger and you can tell um it's 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 definitely intended for a younger audience than the original film was uh, and that's reflected in the age of the new characters who are teenagers. Um, ultimately, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a very noticeable difference. Tonally, the two films have quite a different feel to them. Um, not necessarily bad, but just, you know, it is it is what it is. Uh, how about you? What did you think? I liked it. Along the same line as you, I kind of thought, it's not as good as the first one, of course. Mm-hmm. But it was way better than I expected it to be. Oh, for Uh, sure. It's very well paced. Mm -hmm. The characters are serviceable enough. Mm -hmm. Although I do think there's an awful lot going on. There's far too much going on. There's too many ideas in there. And it's, you know, it's pick one and and run with it. Yes. Yes. Throwing everything at you to to Mm -hmm. see if it sticks. Definitely skews younger. uh, Although the kid characters manage to not be annoying, which I'm always a fan of. I like it when I can tolerate people. Um, Sure. Action was great, although a bit Transformers-ish, as I feared. Mm, it just yeah. was, was was always going to happen. But yeah, I thought it was a, thought it was a good sequel. Um, set set things up nicely for a potential franchise if it ever makes enough money. Although I've seen it <laughs> twice, and I was one of like ten people in the cinema each time. So yeah, we'll ba- see. <laughs> based on my very limited cross section of, of box office checking. It's not probably not going to do all that well unless it, you know, shoots to high figures in China. I think it did reasonably well in the US as well. Mm. I'm sure I read that it stole the box office from Black Panther or that weekend. Oh, interesting. Um, potentially, uh, although that's Black Panther and it's like sixth week or something like that, so you know, <laughs> <laughs> some diminished returns are to be expected. Yeah, yeah. but it was it was decent. I uh, I really enjoyed it much more than I thought I would. Um, Absolutely. I had a really good time. I think 
you know, at no point did, you know, the smile leave my face. I really, you know, like I had a good time throughout. Um, and that's definitely better than what I thought it was going to be. Um, so, so definitely props for that. And as you said, the children were not annoying, which I was kind of, kind of worried about going into it, knowing that, you know, there's, there's a bunch of 15 year olds in there. I'm like, mm, I don't, I don't know about this. Yeah. Uh, but actually they, they were all kind of decent characters. Um, I liked where they took the story. Um, as you said, a good setup for a franchise. If, you know, that is in the cards. They they have the option to do it. Um, very few qualms with it, story wise. I would say, as you said, um, th- there is a lot going on, um, and that's that's one of my issues. Uh, but we'll get to it in the in the spoiler territory because I want to talk about it specifically. Yeah. Um, but yeah, overall, yeah, I think we both went into it with a sense of dread, as as reminiscent of of the last podcast we recorded of the uh, for the first film we were both kind of feeling like uh this is this had better not be terrible um and it wasn't uh it's not it's not pacific rim it's pacific rim uprising and <laughs> <laughs> you know that's that says a lot it's fine um yeah yeah, yeah so on that note, are you ready to do a neural handshake and get into spoilers? Just dig deep. Let's do it. Good. Okay. I will initiate this neural handshake. Pilots ready to connect. Two pilots engaged in neural bridge. Ready to activate the Jaeger Okay, that was successful. Now we can talk about whatever we want. Woohoo! Uh, we're safe in a giant machine and no one can mess with us. So Drift anyway. compatible buddies, yes. <laughs> <That's it>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. It'd be more interesting for the um the, for the whole drift thing if uh, one of us hated it, but well, that's not gonna happen. So. <laughs> no, I don't, yeah, no, I don't think I would. I think I think yeah. it'd be really cool actually. But the the rest of uh, the podcast will be conducted inside our brains, so no one else will hear what we're thinking. So. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's like, all right, bye, guys. <laughs> it's just going to be an hour and a half of dead air. Just be prepared. I mean, that's something as well that they do in both films. Um, the characters, even though they are linked through their through each other's brains, they still verbalize stuff. Yeah. Um, which you know, in theory, is kind of weird, but. I suppose in practice, like you still, like even even though say I'm thinking like a lot faster than I am speaking, like in order to verbalize thoughts, like perhaps the two the two processes aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's okay. Um, and I'm definitely overthinking this 100 <laughs> <laughs> percent for this for this franchise in particular. But in any case. Um, let's start with, um, like, discussing these new characters that have been, um, introduced in the new film. Uh, what did you think of Jake Pentecost as a new main character? Well, we just switched hosts there. That was really weird. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to be the one who's always talking. So, like, yeah. tell me what you think and then I'll chime in. <laughs> I, I liked Jake. Um, he's very very charming and charismatic you know and john boyega does a really good job of of bringing that across uh he has a character arc that's forgotten about it just you know it starts (laughs) off being about something and then yeah it just it resolves itself kind of off screen and then it's i don't want to be a ranger anymore (laughs) and then by the end of the film he's like i'm fully committed to being a ranger again yeah i am definitely a ranger now (laughs) yes when did, when you did that this? happen? Yeah. Five minutes ago, you didn't want to do this. <laughs> yeah. um, I liked him. Uh, I keep thinking about Independence Day 2, which has an equally generic title, The Resurgence. Mm. Oh, yeah, Resurgence? yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I uh, think so, yes. So it's you've kind of got this son of a character that was never... Well, no, in the case of Independence Day 2, he was in the first film, he was just very young. Mm. But uh, you've got this son of a character you haven't really met before who's supposed to carry the film. But John Boyega is much better than whoever that dude was. So it works. Yes. Because whatever gaps there are in how he's written are kind of made up by how good he is at what he does. Yeah, absolutely. 
And I'm not quite... I, I don't quite buy the whole, yeah, so me and Dad were kind of close. It's like, were you? And were you, though? Yeah. Carrying around his little picture, the, the heavily photoshopped picture of <laughs> the three of them. Better Photoshop than I've seen in a lot of films, yeah, to be but, fair. But, yeah, it's, it's a bit ridiculous. But, yeah, it's that mm. kind of... Yeah, they probably would have mentioned you in the first film. Um, uh, if- not necessarily. Um, I've been thinking about this in, you know, the hour and a half since I saw the film. Um, <laughs> I've been thinking about um, his, like, like, the explanation of who he is and why he wasn't in the first film and all those things. I was satisfied with it. Um, I was thinking about Stacker in the first film, you know, and how he was very, he was... Uh, um, what what was his phrase to Raleigh? He he should be a fixed point. Yeah, you know he isn't a person. He isn't Stacker. He is the marshal. He is you know in charge, and that's who he needs to be to people. So you know it makes sense for him, in particular as a person, to not discuss uh, his son. He wouldn't go into it. I don't think. Um, you know, maybe, the, maybe the, before he blew himself up, he would though. Perhaps, yeah. That's yeah. that's the thing, yeah. Michael, um, tell Jake I'm still disappointed in him. Or mm, something, you know, the, yeah, that, something, yeah. That'd be quite a good last word, actually. Last word. <laughs> tell Jake I hope he's not being an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Except he is. Oh, well. Yeah, um, yeah that's true. Um, and, and that is always a danger with adding characters um, in, in kind of second or third installments that weren't there in the original film, you know, kind of the the original trilogy of star Wars suffers a bit for it um, as well with like the, the the Luke and Leia thing, Um, you know, just like adding different elements that weren't necessarily, uh, you know, accounted for in the first film. It it creates continuity issues after, but I, I feel that like they mostly did okay with it. I liked the relationship with Mako um, I liked, I mean, I mean, yes, yes. However brief it was there, um, I believed it. I thought that uh, it, it it accounted well for that introduction and for, for Mako's kind of like relationship with him. I, I really liked that. Um, I really liked seeing Mako in this new like, kind of like more, um, what's the word? bureaucratic role uh okay. seeing her in a position of power like that was really interesting um and they rift they, they rift off of each other quite well um him as a person now like i'm of two minds about the comedy relief um and he's he's really funny and he's really funny on purpose he 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 likes kind of like breaking the tension with kind of comedy moments um, which which he definitely, you know, they're all intentional. Yeah. And, you know, on the one hand, you know, like, of course, like, there's people who are like that, um, and this could very well be a coping mechanism for, like, all the kind of un- unresolved daddy issues that he carries um, and and wanting to prove himself, but also, like, feeling like he has nothing to prove because he's kind of, useless like, like like all of these things c- can be hidden behind that comedy that does work uh in terms of in terms of characterization uh on the other hand uh at some points it felt a bit a bit heavy-handed the comedy a bit you know like all right must we <laughs> must we right now um i don't know uh, and as i said in my spoiler free kind of section i'm not so sure about the meme situations like when he he takes some hundreds and thousands to put on ice cream and he like salt bays them and it's like that's a very 2017 thing to do (laughs) um and that's that is extremely dated it it works for the audience you know like it's gonna get a couple of laughs here and there yeah. But in the grand scheme of the story, what does that imply? Does that imply that Salt Bay happened in Pacific Rim <laughs> universe? You know, like, who is this guy in the Pacific Rim world? Because, like, technology is different. Like, are memes the same? What's 
what is going on? Um, I wasn't, I wasn't quite sure about that. Um, I, d- I don't think that they've overthought it to the extent that I have. They probably just went, ah, it's a funny moment. Just put it in there. It's fine. Um, but it does, it does bother me a little bit in terms of, um, like, in universe, like, what's, what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, it's a bit like in Bright when, um, they, they kind of forget that, it's, a, it's supposed to be an alternate reality until mm-hmm. it's con- you know when it's convenient to do so. Um, although this isn't the bright podcast, but uh, I say that because I recently watched it and that was my immediate thoughts. Like, there's a bit yeah. where the Alamo is mentioned in that film, and it's like the Alamo didn't it, two thousand years ago. Like, nah, yeah. that didn't happen. But I don't know. Uh, it's just one of those one of those things. It's it's a very small thing. Though. I don't think it breaks the universe, you know. Or, and and maybe it's not meant as a meme. Maybe it's just a thing that he's doing, you know. And it's or maybe he invented it. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, perhaps, perhaps. Um, yeah, as I as I said, I think I think it's probably just like a funny moment that they decided yeah. to keep in there uh, without much, you know, deliberation over that. Um, and it's okay. It it worked. It got me to laugh for sure. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, guilty as charged. Yeah. Um, and Jake's a good lead. Um, I mean, the, the film is kind of muddled in that there's several people that could almost be the lead, but, hmm. you know, he's the first person you see, so therefore uh, he's he's definitely a lead. Uh, and he carries it well. Um, I want to see John Boyega and more stuff, you know, and obviously he has Star Wars, but not for hmm. much longer, probably, you know, and I don't think we'll see him after the next one, so... Yeah. Uh, He's in need of a spare franchise to kick around. You know, Marvel haven't picked him up yet, so you know, <laughs> this could be it, or or maybe not. It depends on how it does. But um, yeah, but yeah, he's good. Uh, I liked his back and forth he had with with Nate, who is um, you know, or Scott Eastwood, who is yes, looking and yeah. sounding so much like his dad these days. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In a couple of years, we'll have a spare Clint Eastwood. It's fine. True. <laughs> I'm sure he's already been eyed for the Dirty Harry remakes. hundred <laughs> percent, and I would watch them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it is quite good because it, al- it almost means you have Clint Eastwood in this film, which is good enough, mm-hmm. you know, because he's he is quite good. Although there's less to his character than than there is Jake. He's just kind of there to to be the almost a pseudo antagonist, but even that's forgotten about. Yeah, um, th- there's there's a different relationship. Um, between the pilots and the program in this film than than in the original film. I don't think that at any point in the original film we talk about a concept of, like, adopted family, yeah. um, which uh, weighs quite heavily in this film. And, you know, in conjunction with these kids who, like, some of them are orphans, some of them, you know, have nowhere else to be. Um, and just like the, the idea that they are each other's family, while you know, lovely and sentimental, um, wasn't there in the original film, and that was a little bit confusing. Um, that being said, I liked that they resolved their like issues, and and, and that really their issues weren't serious. It no. wasn't a serious rivalry, a serious kind of like hatred of each other. It wasn't Chuck and Raleigh in the first film. You know, those two would never have, um, you know, resolved their differences so easily. Uh, But that's because Jake and Nate don't really have that big of a beef with each other. It's mostly, you know, Nate is disappointed in Jake and he wants him to be better. And, you know, when Jake kind of sorts himself out off camera, then they're fine. And when it comes down to it, they both behave like professionals as well. Which That's you would true. expect in a military organisation. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's one thing that tends to happen in a lot of the, the superhero TV shows. It's these people that are making these like kind of life and death decisions every day. And they're bickering about petty stuff some of the time. And it kind of gets in the way. But these guys, they are soldiers. So therefore, once their crisis hits, they have to get along. They have to work together. They can't be bickering and and arguing with one another when they've got a problem to solve. And so as soon as the crisis hits, it's pretty much, Mm -hmm. you know, they work well together, they get on with it, and and that animosity goes away, Mm -hmm. which makes sense to a degree. But I would have still liked to see something kind of resolved between them. On camera, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that is is a a bit of an issue generally. 
Um, I think I think we'll we'll get to kind of story level stuff later. Um, but yeah, that that kind of off camera resolution of stuff is is something that they do quite a bit of in this film. Yeah. And you know, like it's okay if you do it once, maybe even twice for like a tiny thing. But if you do it multiple times for several things on different levels, I'm not I'm not quite sure that that works. It's almost like this was a two and a bit hour film that got cut to the bone just to make whatever running time they wanted it to make. Cause very it's, possible. It's very short, actually. I was surprised. Mm-hmm. It's less than two hours. Yeah, under two hours, hundred and eleven yeah. minutes, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, it was over before I even knew it, and, mm-hmm. and I'm not used to that with particularly with blockbusters these days. You know, the, the common criticism coming out of a blockbuster is, man, that was like twenty minutes, <laughs> half an hour too long. Yeah, <laughs> that. Be- yeah, exactly. And that being said, you know, saying the thing about about it being perhaps hacked to pieces to st- and stitched together to, to create a running time that is under two hours. I appreciated that it was under two hours. There's something to be said for, for a shorter film. However, yeah. could it have been done a little bit better? Could the you know different strands be a little bit tighter? Could we avoid these off-camera resolutions perhaps with a couple of extra minutes yeah. Um, yeah, that that I think is a is a very valid criticism. Yeah, um, saying that something's too short is it's kind of a compliment in a way. As in, I was willing to watch a little bit more of this. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, as opposed to oh, I could have really done without twenty minutes of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I often feel that. Yeah. yeah, as you said with blockbusters, yeah, absolutely. It can, can be a bit grating when it's like another two and a half hour thing that I know is going to be half an hour too long. Yeah, nah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. And usually it's it's like you can feel the lull in the story where it's meant to have finished, yeah. and then for some reason it keeps going, and it's like, all right, I I could be done now. Yeah. Um, and this film didn't have that at all. No, which would and and that works to in in its favor i would say yeah. uh cuz it it does kind of maintain a good as you said like uh when we started it's very well paced um and and it does kind of you know take things you know from from a to b to c uh in, in a way that i i thought was quite satisfying um you know with small issues aside of course but yes yeah um I was really happy to, as I say, as I said before, um, you know, see Mako again. I w- was sad to see her go, but I could tell that that's what they were doing, even before the scene where it happens. Um, I could tell that, you know, that th- that's what it was building towards. Yeah, it was the whole, I want you to be there as I'm coming to this thing and... Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's like, just, ooh, yeah, okay, he's oh, she's going to die. die. Yeah. yeah. Oh. I think they did a bit of a disservice to her character, though, because the way she dies is not its not that noteworthy. She just kind of sits in a helicopter and, mm. and it happens, you know. But, the I mean, the moment where Jake jumps forward to try and catch her, that's, well, where Gypsy Avenger, piloted by Jake, jumps forward uh, to try and catch her was, was well done. You know, it, mm-hmm. it, did have, it did have the right emotional beat to it and mm-hmm. um as well and then when the finger scratched along the side of the, the helicopter as well that was it was quite well done i was yeah. impressed yeah was... i liked i liked the scene itself yeah um perhaps it wasn't the kind of death that she deserved but at the same time often you know people and characters who have been you know heroes in the past the deaths are innocuous and that's you know part of it yeah um so so that in itself is not so much a problem for me um i did i didn't like how predictable it felt with i i could have done with without that um and i don't know that it was necessary uh for for jake's growth for example because i, I don't yeah. really think that he's a different person after it happens it's just you know like a sad thing that happens that you know kind of Let's let's this familiar character go. Yeah. And yeah, I'm not. I wasn't super there for that. But that that being said, like some uh, someone of the old cast had to die 
Um, yeah. And since pretty much no one else came back apart from the two <laughs> scientists, I suppose it had to be Mako. Um, I have to, I'll, I'll say it now. I am very disappointed in that we don't find out what happened to Raleigh. That's really weird. He's mentioned once. Yeah. Um, although, have you read Off-handedly the Offhandedly as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think he's, is it twice he's mentioned maybe? Yeah, he's, he's certainly mentioned. Once by name. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have you read the tie-in novel yet? The, the prequel. I haven't. Yeah. No. Yeah. You need to tell me about it. Well, I've read. I haven't read all of it. I read some of mm. it. Eighteen uh, percent, according to my Kindle. Ooh, okay. Uh, yeah. It t- it tells you what happens. I mean, uh, do you want me to spoil it for you? I'm going to spoil it for listeners, but. No. Oh, the, yeah, yeah. Go on, go on. Yeah. I want to know. <laughs> so um, the reason that Mako isn't piling at Jaeger is because she can't. Um, apparently, when in the alien universe, she was exposed to a lot of radiation. And that's kind of screwed her up a bit. And uh-huh. uh, what happens is Raleigh is exposed for a lot longer and dies as a result. So my prediction about he dies of cancer was almost right. Yeah. yeah. See, like, I would have liked... Why wasn't he on the memorial wall then? I was wondering that others? myself. It was, yeah, like, the, the Russian people were there, you know? Yeah. And everyone yeah. else who died in the first film. It's like, nah, nah, he didn't die in combat with a kaiju. He doesn't deserve to be on this wall. Right? You know? Like, yeah, like, that That doesn't That doesn't seem right. Um, I uh, was talking to someone earlier, and they said that um, maybe they are keeping him, you know, kind of in their arsenal to bring him back in a third film. But then that wouldn't make sense with the tie-in, because why would they publish that? It's that, though. You know, it's, it's one of those... Um, it's like the Star Wars expanded universe where everything is canon until it's not, mm. you know, and uh, unless explicitly contradicted by something that's on screen. So, um, yeah, but they didn't bother wrapping his story up in any way. It was just, no. yeah, um, he's not there and Mako is and that's it. And you don't know right. why. So um, maybe his absence on the memorial suggests that in the universe of the film, he's not dead. So, mm. the, I mean, the book doesn't have to tie in. Uh, if they don't want it to, because let's face it, not many people will read it. That is true. Um, it it would be very disappointing for me in terms of, you know, like the, the only reason I would read this is to enrich my you know, knowledge of this universe. Yeah. And if if a bunch of the, these details become uh, decanonized, or like if the entire book is decanonized. It's, you know, it's the same reason why a lot of people have beef with The Last Jedi, you know, it's like just taking, taking, and The Force Awakens as well, like taking decades worth of canon information that people have emotional investment in and then just going, nope. (laughs) Um, Obviously, you know, not the same level of attachment here. No. But it bothers me, like, I really like continuity and I like... I like it when it's done well. And I feel that mostly, like, the, the, the two films have a really good continuity. Um, and I would really hate to see that being disrupted. But I suppose, I suppose that depends on a lot of things. It depends on how this film does. And so if we get a third film... Um, I mean, I do expect it to do well in China with, with the co-production and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Pacific Rim Revenge is my prediction for the title. <laughs> this, this mythical third film. <laughs> yeah, Pacific Rim, now it's on. <laughs> yeah. no, Pacific Rim, now it's personal. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, into the jungle. This time better. it's personal. <laughs> yes. Um, um, yeah, so the kind of handling of... of Mako and and Rally. I mean, Rally's not handled at all. He's just mentioned, but certainly with Mako, yeah. she kind of appears, and and there's that idea of, um, you know, there's the idea that she's important in this world because her opinion holds a lot of weight. Uh, yeah, and you could have probably accomplished the same thing if they just chucked her in a coma. You know, if she's on, if they only want her in five minutes of the film, or well, relatively speaking, five minutes of the film. It's not much more than mm. that, actually. Uh, then chuck her in a coma and maybe she wakes up at the end who knows but um, that would still accomplish that she's not there for that important vote thing and you know you don't have to bring her back you don't have to kill Mm. her off and then and then Jake's got a reason to not be that upset for most of the film Mm -hmm. 
because you know he's just kind of like yeah so my sister just died but you know whatever i'm just putting on normal clothes and i'm okay now and that's yeah yeah <laughs> that's how i deal with grief yeah, somehow wear clothes weird but... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the hand. I mean, the the other characters that came back, uh, Newt mm. and um, the other one, and Herman. Herman. Yes. That's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I wanted to call him Burn Gorman because that's the actor that plays him. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, both completely changed. One with good reason. The other, not so much. Um, mm, Her- Herman I was thought, yeah, very different. I was different. thinking about Herman actually. I was thinking about Herman and why. Like and how he's just so like so much more open now. I've and been digging thinking through about entrails, which is something that he didn't do. He didn't do, but but I like imagine if like I was just thinking about how we leave him at the end of of the first film. Uh, he's he's you know agreed to like the the terrible act of drifting with a kaiju. Um, yeah. He's you know, kind of opened himself up to friendship with Newt, which before he, you know, wouldn't even entertain the possibility of. Um, and I was thinking about the 10 year gap mm-hmm. and how that would have changed him in terms of, you know, like we leave him having, you know, attempted this. How has his science changed or like his approach to science? Is he much less theoretical now? Because before he would only do, you know, calculations on a blackboard. And now he's actually like in a lab, making experiments, getting his hands dirty, as you said, willing to like put his hands in in kaiju entrails and things like that's Yeah, that is quite a big change but i don't think it's unjustified i think that it does make sense for his character to have said okay you know maybe my approach to this was wrong and you know like being a bit more practical with my science will be better for everyone in the end so i don't know like i don't i didn't mind it his main role in this film is they need a scientist who knows things and it's you know every time it's like why is this happening? He's like, here's why it's happening. Here's <laughs> it's, why it's, it's, yes, pretty much. It's just that voice that just knows everything, you know. And uh, him, him, and the Chinese lady who I yeah. want to get back to. Um, <laughs> yes, I mean, in films like this, you always have someone, you know, exclaiming, exclaiming what it is. It's like yeah. I know what it is. It is this, and if and if this happens, then this other thing will happen, and we need to stop it. Uh, <laughs> pretty much, um, it's yeah. it's a. It's a necessary, if shallow, role, I suppose. But it's, it's, it's good. Tr- I quite it's like tropey. Yeah, well. it's tropey for sure. Um, but I, yeah, I think yeah, I think he did a great job. I liked his haircut much better <laughs> than the first film. Uh, he he has improved in the ten year gap. Uh, his style is much better. So well done, well done, Herman. Um, yeah. yeah, Newt is. I I think was fantastic in his in his character uh kind of evolution where he ends up i think makes complete sense even from yeah. the first film from the new that we knew uh it wouldn't be a very far off kind of guess to to kind of like imagine him turning out to be you know a kaiju groupie on steroids yeah yeah i like that and um Interestingly, on a second viewing, it's quite obvious from the beginning he's quite evasive. Mm. When uh, when when Herman's talking about disgusting kaiju, he kind of gives a bit of a a wince there because obviously he doesn't, he doesn't think agree. so. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and uh, I think Charlie Day hams it up quite nicely. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it is quite a hammy role um, because he's just a, a mustache twirling villain for, for some <laughs> of it, which is you know quite. which is great. It works, but. Uh, and, and it's a good place for that character to be. I think they could have been a bit clearer on whether it was actually him being changed or him being, like, possessed. Because yes. it flips from moment to moment. That's yeah. true. Because there's that point towards the, um, well, when he's, uh, when Herman's trying to stop him, he says, I'm sorry, this isn't me, or I'm not strong enough, or something like that. And so mm-hmm. it's, you know, that suggests he's being possessed, but then later on it seems to be him again. So um, I'm not sure. But the... I did quite like the twist of he walks into his apartment and then there's like this kaiju brain piece in his in his room. Yeah, ooh, <laughs> like in that moment I was like, oh, like, uh, just like feeling the the grossness. Um, but yeah. at the same time, like that, yeah, just made so much sense for his character. 
Um, Although he yeah, I would have preferred. You know, no, not at all. I like come that. Come for dinner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come meet Alice, and it's like, really, was that was that like a genuine invitation? Because I want to see. Yeah, that scene, he wouldn't. Actually, he wouldn't Herman take that in. well. Like, what the hell is this? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> and Herman meet Alice, or rather, you know, Alice. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you've met. Mm, great, great, mm, great. Um, yeah, I I agree. We. It, it would have been better if there had been clarity, if if it was him, you know, switching sides, or if like he his brain has joined the hive mind somehow. Yeah. Um, that that would be it. Very interesting to explore, and I suppose you know perhaps they intend to. Yeah. Um, but it would have been very interesting to have that as part of this film, you know, like a, like a clearer explanation of what is going on. I feel like it, it's overcomplicated in this film in a way that the first film was not, you know, it was, yeah. it was very kind of clear what happens with drifting and that that's, you know, you know, you don't by drifting, you, you don't kind of assume each other's brain or like each other's personality traits or anything like that. Um, so, so what is going on there? Uh, with that connection, are the the these precursors like something something else? Do they have kind of like different powers through the drift? Like that, that what is happening? Basically, <laughs> is my question. Um, but that being said, in terms of Nuke being the bad guy, um, it was good. It was you know slightly heartbreaking because he's you know the doofy uh, scientist. He's likable. He's definitely likable in the first film. We've, you know, we bond with him by the end. You know, he's yeah. he's part of the part of the team of good guys. And to see him flip around, it's kind of devastating. But at the same time, I was glad it wasn't the Chinese lady, because um, yeah. the be the obvious. implication, yeah, the implication at the beginning that the Chinese lady is nefarious and has something to hide, and you know. Maybe she set up this this attack um, on the city with the with the rogue um, Jaeger, etc. I like that, and I was hoping that you know it would turn out to be something else. I w I have to say I wasn't expecting it would be Newt. No. Um, I have to say it wasn't it wasn't in my realm of like possible theories, um, but it was an interesting a, a very interesting way. To, to resolve that. Um, speaking of the Chinese lady, um, it's it was kind of like, you know, knowing it's a Chinese co-production kind of makes you think, well, she's she can't be the bad guy because this is a Chinese co-production. They, they, yeah, they don't they don't want to seem like the yeah. bad guys. Yeah. Um, so I was like, okay, so what's happening here? Um, she does do a bit of a 180 at some point. Um, she goes from, you know, stern, science-y slash business lady to battle-trained engineer um, <laughs> without so much as a thought, you know? It's just kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm just going to, like, help you guys now and, like, put my hair down and change my shade of lipstick. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah because was... she was quite cold and, you know, mm -hmm. and uncompromising early in the film. And it's when... Yeah. It's when she... Because she says about the attack... That worked out well for us. Exactly. And, and Newt's the one to say, "Whoa, that's 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 kind of dark." Yeah, like, yeah, that's cold. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, cause, you know, they they voted for our stuff now, so that's all good. You know, there, there's some good in here, and and up until up until the point that she you know remotes to the the scrap uh, to scrap her, she's very mm -hmm. kind of yeah, she's she's very kind of standoffish, and then becomes yeah, one of the team. Quite, and it's one yeah, of those she's things. She's quite cold. She's quite yeah. yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not quite sure. That I mean, I mean, it does work because everything's just kind of happening in that moment, and so we accept it. it must um, be from that but, second act that was cut. Mm, <laughs> yeah, th thinking back on it, um, it's it's you know at the end when she she manages to help them and everything is fine, and it's kind of like oh you know like actually I really like her, but wait a minute, like I don't know anything else about her. Yeah. Than we found out at the beginning of the film, and this this change, this 180, doesn't feel justified. Yeah. Um, 
and I mean, come to think of it, we never really find out why she is so keen on those drones at the beginning, why this is like her mega plan. We don't really know why. She just has come up with this and has the money, and so, you know, does it. Yeah. <laughs> but why? It's a good question. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. seem interested in, in answering it, but it, it gives the, the Chinese star some time to, you know, sit stand in the spotlight for a bit. And, and that's fair mm-hmm. enough. I think... Um, you know, oh, she does quite well, yes. In pretty much every Hollywood film she's in, she's occupied that role. You know, mm-hmm. the, the Great Wall, for instance, she's more of the protagonist than Matt Damon is. Oh, okay. Um, you know, in... in uh, I don't mind the Great Wall actually; it's not too bad. Uh, I never saw it. Yeah, Skull Island; she's pretty p- prominent as well. Oh, that was her. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Mm-hmm. Those are the only Hollywood things I can think of that that she's mm. um, she's been in, and IMDb yeah. g- agrees with agrees with me. So oh, okay. it's one of those <laughs> quite a big actor in China, not so much in the US, but yeah. You know, is given the screen they're time pushing of a big her, actor though. in the US. You know. Yeah, yeah, they're they're definitely pushing her to. To Hollywood for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fair no, enough. she does. She does quite well. Um, and I would love to see her in more things. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think you will. Mhm. Mhm. Yeah. Over the next few years, I think she'll turn up in more, especially more franchisey stuff. If they want the Chinese market, it's exactly. Yeah. You know, it's. I was. It's a necessary thing. I was. You know, it's not necessary evil because it's not evil to cast Chinese actresses and. No, no, no. Uh, absolutely. Western productions, yeah. but I suppose it's in the sense of this is what the Chinese financiers want mm-hmm. fine you know uh, it doesn't get in the way you know the, no not at all th- that role yeah. could be occupied by any character so mm-hmm. fair enough and and maybe she was replaced you know at the end of the film maybe there was another character that she replaces uh, mm-hmm. for example nate's girlfriend whose name i've already forgotten jules was jules, her name was yeah I want to talk about Jules. I want to talk <laughs> is, about is the there implication. Much to talk about? <laughs> no, she's in it for I, you know, to be eye candy for like I think a grand total of four minutes of screen time. But uh, the implication, and this is and this is a very queer reading of this, and I'm hoping that you know it will reignite fandom, the the Pacific Rim fandom that I love so much. Um, who knows? Maybe maybe it will kindle something. But the <laughs> implication, all right, that she is kind of into both Nate and Jake, and with the added implication that Jake thinks Nate is sexy, um, yeah. makes me think of like like a very nice kind of like triangle situation <laughs> that would be very interesting to explore. Um, although I don't think that they'll go for it, but the fans will go for it, and that's what I'm here for. I'm here for the fan fiction and, like, the stuff that will come out of it. Like, I'm just, yeah, like, I hope so. I hope I'm not the only one who saw this. Um, <laughs> well, I think, I think, I think that's pushing, it. <laughs> pushing it partly, yeah? uh, or maybe the whole, I don't know, maybe a kind of modern open relationship sort of scenario. She's like, I've got room exactly, in my life for yes. both of you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, can, exactly, yes. Can their egos let there be a room in her life for both of them? That's a question <laughs> for another film. <laughs> quite, quite right. Yeah. Um, yes, but it's it's true that she she very much was in the background just like to be good looking, uh, sit there and look pretty kind of situation. Which push the holograms you know, around. She did a lot of that. Oh yeah, that is true. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, as as an aside, thinking of the the scenes that we see her in, I want to say something about the Jaegers, the new Jaegers. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really like the names of the Jaegers. They they're very true to like the weird kind of naming of Jaegers that we see in the first film. You know, we have we have Jaegers like Saber Athena and um, Bravo something or other but bracer omega and uh like i I don't know what the third one is um looking them up (laughs) yeah Yeah, um, completely blanking right now uh, and the athena one that looks like um it looks like chappy yes (laughs) (laughs) yeah i wanted to say about the designs that this is where the transformers element comes in yeah and it bothered me a little bit in that the original film had, you know, a distinctive look 
for each of the Jaegers. You know, they were all very different looking. Uh, the the weapons they had and like the different capabilities uh, were very much tailored to the pilots. And yeah. in this case, you know, these kind of felt a little generic. Yes, one of them had a mace and the other one had an electric whip of some kind, but they all have swords. Yeah. And like it it just doesn't seem as kind of unique and and individualized as the others. Obviously, you know, the the kids come in as pilots because there's nobody else. Yeah. That's fine. Um but yeah, th- th- there's no kind of like reverence for these for these like big machines like in the original film the the, the um, Russian Jaeger, Cherno Alpha and Gypsy Danger, they have their own kind of bit of music. Yeah. Um, and there's none of that in this. And it kind of bothered me, you know, it was just kind of like, here's these big machines. And it's like, well, Jaegers are more than that. And to, to reduce them to just being these, these big machines, I was yeah, very disappointed. Well, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it seems that anyone can pilot any of them. Yes. Yeah. I didn't um, like that. The I names have to were say. Guardian Bravo, Ra- Bracer Phoenix, and Saber Athena, and oh, Captain Avenger, you. of course. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, but I can't remember which one's which. I know that Saber Athena is the chappy one. Yes. The other two, I can't remember which one's which. So yeah. the Bracer, I think the Bracer one is the one that uh, the three kids pilot together. It's, it's the one with the mace, the kind of chunky one. Nope, that's Guardian Bravo. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm just looking at pictures of them. I thought Guardian oh, no, Bravo no, was um, the one sorry, with the no, whip. You're right. Yeah, Bracer Phoenix is the mace hmm. one. It's just the diagram I'm looking at doesn't have the mace, so it must be an older ah. diagram. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, Guardian Bravo is the, um, the one with the whip. The one with the whip. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, like, even though, like, they do have some subtle differences, they're kind of generic looking, just kind of, you know, Transformers-y. Yeah. And, yeah, I wasn't a big fan of this. But, you know, part part of what really made the first film have an appeal to me was, you know, that the Jaegers felt like they had personalities somehow. Yeah, well, I um, remembered all of them after mm-hmm. only seeing it once. Yeah. Yeah, and because they were distinct enough. And even though there's, you know, well, Cherno Alpha gets most to do out of, you know, out of the expendable ones. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, even Crimson Typhoon has you know. Well, it's the three arms and it's the three arms, and it's and red. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, although you do get that fanboy or fangirl moment from Athena, uh, from Athena Amara. Uh, Amara, and, yeah. You know, when Absolutely. she arrives, she's like, "Oh my god, it's that one!" And it's mm-hmm. that one. And her kind of her connection to Saber Athena when she saw it, I was like, "All right, mm-hmm. that's got to be the one she's in later." And yeah. actually, it isn't because <laughs> she's. <laughs> Yeah, because she's in um, the Bracer Phoenix one. Yeah. Um, but yes, I I actually really like that about her, that she's a Jaeger fangirl, yeah. um, you know, and, and that she really likes uh, all these different ones and that she knows she knows a lot about them and stuff. I, I like that she she builds Jaegers and that's like her her kind of thing, more so than being a pilot. That's very interesting. Um, and very interesting to have like a really young girl do that. Um, yeah. That's quite badass. I, I thought she was a really good character as well. Mm-hmm. The way she, um, I mean, her kind of journey, I suppose, was very similar to Mako's. She loses her parents in very yes. similar circumstances, and um, although her upbringing is different, as in it's implied that she essentially raised herself. Mm-hmm. Uh, or maybe there was some kind of orphanage stuff that you don't hear about. But yeah, and there's almost that. She has to learn to take the leap because um, she jumps into Gypsy's hand, but yes. it doesn't come across very well. You know, she refuses. No, to jump yeah, her, it's and, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I don't think um, that I liked the parallel with Marco too much here because it's it's too on the nose. Yeah. Um, you know, they it's have a similar. very similar. Yeah, of a too similar story. Where, you know, they came face to face with a kaiju, they lost their family in an attack, 
you know, it was very much, you know, a big traumatic experience. Uh, but it was so similar to Mako's that I was like, mm, like I get the, I get what you're doing here, like bringing in this new girl, and like she, she is like the new face of of this kind of like generation. That's fine. Oh. Um, but I, I don't know that we needed to have like a very similar kind of traumatic backstory here. I, I don't know that it, it works. In the drift, which is the same. Exactly. The exactly. Same. Yeah. Like she gets she gets caught in the moment. She she yeah. chases the rabbit, as they say in the first film. Um, you know, he he isn't able to like shake her out of it. Like it's all Jake's these fault things. For not like, telling her not to do that, though. That's true, and she wasn't really forewarned. That's yeah. yeah. Um, but but still, just kind of. Mm, I I don't know that that was necessary. No, I thought she was good though. She was, she bounced off. Boyega really well, and mm-hmm. uh, she could certainly match his wits with him. You know, when they were yeah. arguing and stuff like that. she had a lot of personality, which is good because the other cadets had no personality, um, or they had one distinct personality trait. Like Victoria, she's angry, or Vicky. Yes, yeah. you know, <laughs> she would beat me up for calling her Victoria. So yeah, um. <laughs> and the others, I don't even remember anything about them. There's one whose dad's a plastic surgeon. That's, that's it. That's, that's all I remember. And then there's the, <laughs> and then there's the Russian boy whose grandmother used to play him the trolling song. Yeah, what was which that? is oh. hilarious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's the most um, self aware moment the film has. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like we're gonna troll you now, quite literally. Yeah. Um, and make a reference to an old meme. So you know. There's that kind of dated moment as well. And there was a bit where Newt says, "Oh, so we're going with the giant robots again," just as you know, hmm. as a bit of a, a jab. Yeah, again. it's a comment. It's it's, concept, it's yeah. yeah, it's a very direct, direct jab. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, she's good. Uh, if there's another film, I'd like to see her progress. I mean, she becomes a ranger at the end, just you know, because there's no one else. Um, so that you know, it's a very. It's a very standard Hollywood heroic thing, you know. She's Captain Kirk is in command of the Enterprise by the end of the film because, of course, he is. Yes. You know that 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 kind of journey. It's the under pressure, they prove themselves, and and that completes the training that they should also have. It's like, no, you mm-hmm. did really well. Now we're going to put you through training. Now you've got the confidence to complete training. But I suspect that she's just ready for normal missions after that, which is mm-hmm. fine. Um. I think they kill off two of the kids and you don't really notice as well. When one yeah, of the yeah, one yeah. of the Eagers falls, it's like, oh yeah, they're, they're dead and I'm pinned. And it's like, we'll come back and get you later. And then they don't. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they do. It's just, once again, off camera. We don't yeah. see it, but I'm sure it yeah. happens. And there's a bit of a Power Rangers vibe to all the, the, car- uh, the teenagers hanging around as well. I would you know, say so, yes. And they're getting in giant robots, which is what they mm-hmm. do in Power Rangers, uh, which, which I quite like. You know, I, I like the idea of uh, teenagers rising up to to stop it, to stop the the destruction of Earth. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, it's it's very expensive looking, so if you squint, you can almost pretend it's a Power Rangers movie as well. <laughs> I mean, the robots don't combine, but the monsters do. So yeah. <laughs> Which is yeah, yeah. I don't even want to think about the physics of that. How does that work? <laughs> I mean, th- there were these weird cockroachy robot things. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, I'm not thinking about it too hard. No, no. Let's just it, it happened, yeah. and that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's about it for characters. I think. I don't think there's much, much else. Uh, that's uh, yeah, I think we've I think we've pretty much covered everybody. Yeah, significant mm-hmm. characters anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. So. Story-wise, I mentioned that I think there's a bit too much going on here. And I remember mm-hmm. over the years hearing about different ideas that Del Toro had if he was ever to do a sequel. So it was, you know, we might make uh, Newt the villain. We might do uh, Kaiju Jaeger hybrids. We might do drone warfare. We might do this. And, and it's like someone, and they did all of it. <laughs> someone involved with this film read those interviews and thought, brilliant, we're going to do all of these at once. <laughs> and it doesn't work in that respect, because you don't spend enough time on any of them. So I think the possible Rogue Jaeger plus drone plot is enough for this film. Hmm. Uh, and then, you know, you have the whole um, Newt is the villain. You could probably hint at that at the end of the film. This presupposes you're getting, like, more films, but... Um, 
the post credits thing could be new, revealing that he was behind the drone attack or something. I don't know. Um, but I think there was too much going on, and it's and a lot of those ideas were interesting on their own. I quite like the idea of rogue Yeagers cropping up. I mentioned it in the first podcast, although it was more in the context of maybe nations fighting each other because the kaiju aren't a problem anymore. Um, mm-hmm. But the drone thing, you know, that's a very real problem that's facing our world mm-hmm. today. The kind of divorcing from the humanity of it because it's a drone attack and no one cares because mm-hmm. no one actually has to be there to press the press the button and, and kill people. Yes. Um, and you get a bit of that with the pilots feeling like they're about to become obsolete. Mm-hmm. Although it doesn't do anything with it because there isn't time. Yeah, and because the the drones are very quickly kind of disposed of. Yeah. And then, the, you know, so that's that. Okay. Um, th- there's the, as you said, like the, the very quick kind of turnabout of the... Um, uh, the the Jaeger uh, kaiju hybrids, which yeah. you know again, super interesting concept, lasts about two minutes and then is done away with, which is a shame because I think that was a very interesting concept. I thought I thought you know oh so that's our big our big conflict here fine, yeah. and then that's done away with very quickly. The the you know it's it moves on to like uh, oh before that's done away with the 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 manage to open these rifts um and the, like the breaches yeah and i thought that you know oh so that's going to be the big kind of you know <laughs> moment where everything feels like it's lost and stuff but then that ends really quickly as yeah. well it's like just too neat um and and the three the three the things that remain um the idea as well, uh, this bothers me, the idea that we didn't understand what the kaijus were doing. Yeah. When the attacks on, the, like during the war, when the war was still happening, um, they were very much spaced out across the Pacific Rim from from very north to very south. And at no point were they moving outwards towards Japan. Yeah, why would one swim to Sydney after coming out of the breach if it was going straight for Mount Fuji? Right? So, yeah. like, the idea that all of these kaijus in the first film were doing this is false. Like, I, I don't think that that it makes much sense. No. And it bothers me that, you know, like, maybe these ones are doing this. That's fine. Yeah. Um, but to imply and, and to, like, very directly say, oh, like, this is what the first ones were doing. No, they weren't. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, like, I don't know. I don't know where that where you got that from. But I really yeah. don't think that that's what was happening. And it's the fact that a bunch of people in a room full of holograms can figure it out in 20 seconds when it took decades right? <laughs> of war that no one yeah, was like, any the wiser. If, if every kaiju in the past was trying to get to Mount Fuji and then it just somehow wasn't working, yeah. uh, like, why would they attack the different cities and not yeah. just, like, go for Japan? Yeah, keep plowing um, the same way every time, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you could have almost fixed that if uh, Herman was like, I said this before and no one listened to me. Mm. You know, that would have been the... Yeah, everyone thought I was crazy because yeah. I do kind of act crazy, fine. But yeah. it, it's one of those things... Um, you know, I've, I've been watching and watching Krypton and it seems the uh, the L family are famous for being right but nobody believes them. And that mm. could be Herman. You know, it's... I said they were going for Mount Fuji. I don't know why, but I said they were and uh, mm. no one listened. You know, and, and yeah. but again, that would have possibly been mentioned in the first film, but who knows... Uh, yeah, it's it's definitely made up for this film to manufacture a conflict. Uh, and yeah. oh, this is what their plan was all along. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I I also kind of don't like how, and that's that's a personal pet peeve, um, but I don't like how Tokyo has somehow expanded to the feet of Mount Fuji. <laughs> uh, like I don't know if you know where Tokyo is and where Mount Fuji is, yeah. but they're not close together. Um, no. And the idea that, you know, I thought that this was another town or another city. Yeah. And then somebody says, oh, it's in Tokyo. And it's like, no, but they're at Mount Fuji. That's not where Tokyo is. Yeah. Um, and that really bothered me. I was like, like, even if it has expanded, like, 
you know, to swallow up other towns and become this mega metropolis, which, you know, not unlikely. Why not? I guess. Um, but it's, it's just like, I don't know. It just didn't, just didn't gel very well with me. Um, I, I, you know, could have done with an explanation of some kind for why the geography is just so off. Um, but maybe yeah, that's just me overthinking things again. Who knows? Kaiju wasn't moving that fast, and Gypsy Avenger wasn't sitting there twiddling its thumbs for long enough. Mm. You know, it was it, there was an awful lot of urgency to it. So it was, it was, yeah, yeah that was kind of bizarre. No, it was um, very close. Like when they all first landed, when all the Jaegers land, um, and the Kaiju's are walking through the city. Um, the, it's just you know Mount Fuji's literally right there, yeah, and that just is not right if you look at a map. So I was like, why, why, <laughs> why is any of this like you know not addressed? Yeah. Um, d- 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 on on the note of of walking through the city and just the destruction in this film, right, is- Man of Steel or. Oh my Batman god, Mystic yes, Man, right? thank you. Yeah. I was just like, is this Metropolis? What is going on? Like, Although there was, like, a, just... there was a line that cleared it all up. It was, everyone has mm. been, everyone is now safe. Go ahead and like, tra- trash the place. <laughs> it was like they were giving them permission, but we, we saw so. a bunch of people running around like a minute ago. Yeah. And they weren't all safe. Also, one of the kaijus burrows through the ground. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, not the safest place to be is underground, so yeah. Yeah, but and it, even so, like you know, just the Jaegers, like even like, like these people, the, the pilots, like they know th- this is a city that people live in. You know, can you please be mindful and not trash it? Thanks. Um, you know, like <laughs> it just felt gratuitous, and I, I just didn't much care for it. I'm, I'm yeah. not here for for smashy smash scenes i have to say um you know it was fun don't get yeah, me wrong i, thought it was, I guess I thought it was fun, fun to watch, watch. Yeah. yeah but every every so often you know they would crash through a building or throw each other you know and and three skyscrapers would just like tumble on each other and i'd be like oh god oof oof <laughs> that's a lot of destruction that's yeah. a lot of rebuilding that needs to be done that's a lot of rubble that needs to be collected from the streets you know just just too much work. <laughs> yeah, it's going it's going to be a a messy cleanup after after this. Yeah, pretty oh, pretty messy. Yeah, absolutely. There was a bit in Sydney earlier as well where um Gypsy picks up a bunch of cars with its gravity gun. And it's not <gasps> yes, clear if oh there's people God. in them. I mean, they've not checked, have they? You know, you don't Even if even if there aren't any people in them, those are people's cars. <laughs> that really bothers me. It happens in a vet in um, uh, Civil War, Captain America Civil War. They they just like at some point uh, Scarlet Wonder's Witch just chucking cars throwing, at people. Yeah, yeah, just <laughs> chucking cars at people, and it's like those are people's cars. It's like <laughs> private property. Yeah. You're destroying a lot of people's property. What are you doing? Um, yeah, that didn't really sit well with me. I have to say that the gratuitous destruction. I'm not. I'm not a massive fan of anyway. Whether or not there's an implication of like thousands of people dying, um, even you know, just like senseless property destruction, like buildings and entire cities. I'm, you know, if we can minimize this, that would be great. Thanks. Uh, you know, somebody needs to at least address it. Yeah, I actually prefer it when there's, there's innocence still kicking about, because at least there's more. Mm. There, there are further stakes to it. You know, you're just wrecking yeah, a bunch of empty buildings. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. you know that's kind of boring. So uh, it seems like ever mm. since Man of Steel, every blockbuster that has um, you know has property damage in it has to have that line that says yeah. there are no innocent people in the area. Don't worry, yeah, the people yeah. are safe. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, well, I saw like a bunch of people running around a minute ago, and there was a bunch of people that never got inside a shelter yeah. a minute ago. So unless there's a mm. shelter right next door. We've got problems here, and yeah, yeah. The fact is, okay, most of the people have gotten to safety, um, but not all of them. Let's, you know, that that gives you that, that's collateral damage that they need to be mindful of. Mhm. Um, but it's just kind of yeah, we're in a you know we're in a building, we're in a city full of buildings. Let's just trash them all and let's use our gravity yes. to pull buildings down and all that. And oof, 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 oof. Yeah. And I guess I mean you're going to commit collateral damage anyway when you're you know dealing with things of that size. It's 
you know, you you can't take a step without stepping on a bunch of cars or whatever. But um, but you know, some some effort to not break everything um, might be exactly. appreciated. Exactly, some effort. I would like to have seen some effort that there just isn't any and you know perhaps it is because you know these kids are super young um perhaps you know i mean it is kind of a you know very last ditch battle to save the world and so yeah. i suppose there's no no time to think of whether you know they, they have to pick up this rubble after it's like well if we don't do this everybody will die yeah. uh somehow with, with all this like toxic gas business i laughed i laughed out loud when uh you know the 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 last kind of conflict is revealed yeah um and it's like oh if the if the kaiju blood makes uh contact with mount fuji uh there's going to be toxic gas like basically everywhere and everybody's going to be wiped out it will wipe out all <laughs> life and i'm just like i just like guffawed in the cinema and and i don't i don't often do this uh even with pacific rim and you know it's it's knowingly ridiculous concepts um even even so i'd still be like you know i would suspend my disbelief and go yeah okay this works in universe whatever um but this is not science this is not like even remotely science fiction (laughs) it's like what is what how do you explain this toxic gas thing erupting from like everywhere in the world because of Mount Fuji somehow? Like, please explain to me in a way that isn't completely stupid. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, like in any case, like I found that to, to be kind of, you know, it, it was the, the one thing that I felt was too much. Um, <laughs> if there is anything in this film that I kind of went, all right, yeah, no, I draw the line. It was this. I absolutely um, love the line that Mount Fuji is rich in rare earth, earth elements. Yes. <laughs> if they're rare, how could it be rich in them? Well, because they're only there. That's where <laughs> they only, that, like, it's just congregated in, in that one spot on Herman Earth in like, this active them. volcano somehow. Yeah, Herman does, does uh, them, but I can't remember what they were. But then it's, it's that kind of thing about, we can use them to make rocket boosters. It's like, but they're really rare. Should you be wasting them on yeah. that? <laughs> 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 also, if, you know, this film has taught me two more efficient ways than Jaegers to defeat Kaiju. One yeah. is something in space that you can drop on them. It seems to work. Yes. Um, it's, I'm reminded of the, the weapon in the second G.I. Joe film. You know, it's just a big rod that they drop on London and it levels it. Something like that, you know, much more efficient. Yeah. Satellites in orbit, quick for those, no problem. Yeah, just let, just let yeah. gravity do, it, do the yeah. job, yeah. pretty much. Or those boosters attach mm. them to the kaiju. Yeah. <laughs> Fling them into space. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> Fling the kaiju into space. Yeah. Um, Why not? So there, there's two better ways than Jaegers. It'd be less fun. Yeah. And, you, and for the second one, you still need the Jaegers. Yeah, um, I do have to say that the way that the mega kaiju died at the end with, like, the one blow, how fortuitous is that? Like, I was like, what if that doesn't work? What if, like, it's still, like, jokes on you, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and, like, it does take one one more breath before it kicks the bucket. And I was like... All right, here, see, told you. Um, but then it dies anyway, and I'm like, oh, well, that was a bit cheap, wasn't it? Um, it was, once again, you know, the conflict is kind of resolved in a very simple way. Yeah. And I was um, I was actually more concerned about the, the mathematical precision that had been be involved in hitting the damn thing, especially when the booster just flies about all over the place. Exactly. And, you know, they make it into the sky and then they're off course and it's let's fire the plasma cannon. You know, well yeah. um you know the I think they call it the A team maneuver. You know, this it's not a <laughs> tank, it's a plasma cannon. But the the, the idea is like right now we're perfectly lined up. Well not quite perfectly lined up. We've like must have extrapolated how fast the thing is moving and yeah. we are lined up to you know to hit where it's going to be. So that you know, you're you're talking like hours of calculations to work this out, and Seriously. that's and that's when they actually have control over where they're dropping from, which they mm. didn't. And they're just they're lucky they weren't over. I don't know, somewhere completely different. Yeah. By the time by the time they get up to the the atmosphere. Yeah, uh, I would say that this kind of the, the, this <laughs> outlandish um, 
way in which it ends is is more ridiculous than the entirety of the first film combined, I have to say. Yeah. Uh, it just doesn't seem plausible, even within, you know, the universe that it occupies. It still kind of it rings false somehow. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, along with, you know, some of the other aforementioned conflicts that end too quickly, the breaches that close too conveniently, the... Uh, you know, subroutine that was coded into the thing so that they can disable the drones and just like like all of these things somehow too convenient. Um, this and... automated company that builds things that no one notices are being built. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a bit weird. There's, yeah, there's got to be someone in those factories just looking to make sure things are working. So would the would someone maybe have noticed a fake kaiju brain getting put inside a Jaeger? Mm. And, and the whole fake kaiju brain thing was okay. So now they're cloning them themselves. Yeah, who who what? did that engineering job? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Who's who's got that kind of level of biological knowledge? Because mm. well, I suppose well, no, it was kind of Newt's field, but also sort of not. Also, kind of not. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know. I suppose I suppose the implication is that it was him doing all of it by himself somehow. Yeah. Um. Even though he must have had help. Because the entire, um, you know, you have to have all the drones ready in 48 hours or else. Yeah. Like, truly, like, he can't have done all of that by himself. Like, there's no way. So I mean, They mentioned there was kaiju cults, essentially, or like a kaiju religion, at least, mm-hmm. in the first film. Yeah. So, you know, they just chuck in that. He, you know, he has some help from the mm-hmm. devout. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh yeah, that would see that would have been very a, a very interesting a strand to pursue. Yeah, he could be like um, a god to the or like their messiah like or whatever. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, that would have been really that would have been really cool. Um, yeah, th- as opposed to just like all th- this combination of like tiny little conflicts that are massive in scale, but you know, really small within the film itself. Um, it would have been better, I think, to give room to one strand to yeah. be developed and to feel kind of more cohesive yeah. rather than have, like, all these, like, individual battles. Like, at least in the first film, the battles, the, the action sequences are all building upon the same conflict. Yeah. They're not, they're not like, three different things. I think there's three set-piece kind of battles that are, you know equally spaced within the film yeah. and they, they are direct escalations of the one before and they all kind of, you know, raise the stakes higher and higher to the point where, you know, it's like critical and, and you know, the, this is it. Like, yeah. the, the world is about to end and this is it and everything has been building up to this moment. Whereas, like, I, I have to say that the, the conflicts in this film don't feel the same. No. I think the drones going haywire thing would be absolutely fine for this film. Especially mm. since you could have started with, um, I guess, the rogue Jaegers chucked in there as well, because I quite like that idea of the, you know, a kaiju brain being... In, it's not even a real kaiju brain, it's like a cloned one, but the idea of a kaiju mm. brain being inside a Jaeger body is, is quite cool. Uh, that's a cool mm. idea. Keep that. But the, the drones thing, so they go berserk at first. I mean, this exact same plot pretty much exists in Transformers 4, where you have this oh. thing where they think they're building their own Transformers, and it turns out Megatron has infected them and is running them secretly, so essentially only letting them think that they're succeeding in order to get what he wants. And that's mm. fine. Um, but I think with this, you, so you've got the drones, they go out in a couple of missions, they malfunction a bit, but not enough to be serious, and then as the film goes on, more and more weird stuff starts happening and then your final climax is essentially the hybrid thing yeah you know and they'll manage to open a breach maybe another one Mm. you know um and then you reveal that newt was behind it towards the end you know Mm -hmm. that's that's one film there that would have been more than enough yeah yeah somehow this feels like three films crammed into one yeah um, as you said before, you know, they had so many ideas and instead of picking one, they just went with all of them. <laughs> yeah. Just throw it all at the screen, see what sticks, you know. <laughs> and it's a shame because it means you can't do it again and have them all developed because no one's going to be building drones after this. Yeah, exactly. You know, but, but it seems like the remote control technology is viable. Mm-hmm. 
I guess, um, because uh, what's her name? Shao, she uses it towards the end. Yeah. Um, so that's viable enough, at least on smaller Jaegers. So mm. more smaller Jaegers, more effective than less bigger ones. Who knows? Mm. I liked Scrapper though. That was a that was a the little Jaeger that could. Yes, the little Jaeger that could. I loved the first scene of uh, of them running, you know, in the little Jaeger, and you know, kind of trying to outsmart Rolling the, the bigger <laughs> one. Yeah, I was like, this is such an interesting idea. In a film about, you know, go big or go extinct. Yeah. Um, you know, the idea that maybe smaller ones might be more effective because they can move quicker. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, wasn't necessarily explored. Um, you know, the idea... What, what does the Russian pilot girl say? She says, you know, bigger is better. Yeah. But is it? You know, wouldn't it be interesting if, like, you know, at the very end of the day bigger isn't better Mm -hmm. Uh, that would be an interesting thing to say you know for for a film that's obsessed with giant monsters and giant robots you know especially when they 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 make it clear that drift compatible pilots are a finite resource they're Mm -hmm. difficult to find so that's the the smaller jaeger solves that problem you just need Mm -hmm. someone to pilot them Mm -hmm. although the the drift compatibility thing changed i think in this film because the first film was very much about you have to be drift compatible with that other person. Mm-hmm. So in theory, everyone's drift compatible. They just have to find out who they're drift compatible with. I mean, yes. In this one, it's, no, we're, we're all drift compatible. It's, you know, the midichlorians. They have the midichlorians. No, no, no. I don't, no, I don't <laughs> think so. I don't think so. This was about, you know, creating an academy in order to forge drift compatibility, like to, to artificially create it. Um... And I don't think that that is necessarily in conflict with what we know about drift compatibility from the first film. Although there is the mention of um, finding drift compatible pilots is difficult, so yeah, it does suggest it's difficult that there's... to find them. So maybe yeah. it's easier to bring in, you know, younger uh, recruits and then have them build strong connections from childhood, yeah. so that then they can be drift compatible, perhaps all together perhaps, you know, in different combinations. If they're all, you know, very, if they're all very strongly connected with each other, like a strong emotional bond, like strong friendship or, you know, being part of a military unit, yeah. that is also a very strong bond. And, you know, like like an artificial drift compatibility. I thought that was actually a very interesting idea, which, mm. I, you know, I was surprised that they hadn't thought of that. I suppose they didn't have the time during the war yeah. to do that. So they had to find pilots who had the drift compatibility to start with. And, yeah, that is a challenge. Yeah, there, there was definitely a sense of, we've spent the last ten years thinking about this stuff. Well, yeah. even if the writers haven't as such. But, you know, it's the idea that, yeah, we're it's a foregone conclusion that at some point Kaiju will come back, so we're going to make sure mm-hmm. we're ready this time, you know, etc. But then, And then when they do come back, it's just after they've had their entire military operation just decimated yeah. which is which is quite funny it was quite easily decimated actually mm-hmm. um but a few drones you know they can't mobilize they can't get into jaegers quick enough apparently uh, <laughs> yeah but yeah, yeah i see what you're saying about the drift compatibility thing i just you know i, I kind of latched on to the it's hard to find drift compatible compatible mm. people so i don't know maybe maybe there is a bit of both in there but um i think you know like it's not mutually exclusive like, yeah. yeah, it's hard to find drift compatible people. Therefore, how about we get these kids in and we make them drift compatible? Yeah. Um, you know, like that doesn't necessarily negate what we already know. It just kind of builds upon it in a way that is perhaps unexpected. Yeah, and there, then there's the... Um, that's kind of where the family angle comes in, I suppose. If you force mm-hmm. them to think of themselves as a family. Yeah. And they'll have more invested in one another. But Yeah. Um, they don't tell you enough about the relationships between the existing kids though you know you know yeah, that, that's um, true and it would have been really nice to see yeah they, you know that amaya can't drift with them easily because she doesn't know she them doesn't that have way. that bond with mm-hmm. them yet mm-hmm. although she can't even drift with the brain that they're keeping in a jar yeah which you know she can't even drift with with jake you know it's she's yeah. not she's not very good at it yet and that's you know quite telling 
I suppose towards the end, you know, it needs must, and so everybody just kind of <laughs> just gets on with it. Goes for it, yeah. yeah. It's like, well, we have no choice now. It's kind of like the it's the Herc, um, not not the Herc, sorry, it's the Chuck and Stacker yeah. situation where it's like, well, it doesn't matter. I know who you are. I can drift with you just fine. It doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Plus, I suppose at that point they were all united in their common cause of, you know, um, killing those Jaegers. Yeah. And Jake had just given his really bad motivational speech. <laughs> I'm not my father. I'm not a really good mo- motivational speaker. Do you understand? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I think they, you know, I think that it would have been better if his speech had been. I'm not my father. Mm. I can't give a good motivational speech. So get Let's the Jaegers. Go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I really liked, um, you know, the cancelling the apocalypse speech, I think, was referenced a couple of times. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, I really liked that jab. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, Stacker was a great guy. Really good speech writer. You remember the one about cancelling the apocalypse? <laughs> yes, we all do, Newt. It was amazing. Um, yeah, I quite I quite liked, you know, the, the self-referential kind of aspect of that. Um, yeah. I think there was a lot more of it in this film. You know, it felt very much like, you know, as I said, like a 2018 kind of thing, you know, to 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 jab at the first film in various ways and kind of, you know, make fun of the, the outlandishness. Like, part of why I like the first film is that it takes itself just seriously enough to, to you know, it, it basically make you convinced that this, this world, you know, works. Yeah. Um... Whereas this one, it it does kind of poke fun at itself and at the first film a little bit. Um, yeah. Not that it doesn't work, but it kind of breaks that spell a little bit. Yeah, and your point about 20, it being a 2018 film, I mean, we've both made comparisons to all sorts of other kind of blockbusters from Transformers to, um, well, I suppose the first one, which is unique in itself, and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Power Rangers... Um, Independence Day 2, you know, that yeah. kind of stuff. It's the, you know, it, it does kind of borrow quite heavily from a load of other stuff. Yes, it um, joins it joins kind of an arsenal of existing kind of um, tropes within the blockbuster genre that I yeah. think the first film kind of didn't have as much of. Yeah. Yeah. Or at least its influences were less familiar to Western audiences, I suppose, because of where Del Toro. Because of the Japanese, from. yeah, because yeah. of the Japanese influence, yes. Yeah, which is you know makes it unique in itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one feels less unique, and it was it's interesting how quickly I kind of started to forget parts of it. I mean, the it came out of the cinema, and actually I had my heart set on four stars as my rating when I came out, yeah. and mm-hmm. then by the time I got home to write about the thing. I talked myself down to three stars. Same. Yeah. yeah, like I was thinking about it as I was watching the film. I was like, oh, this is a four-star movie. I'm having yeah. a great time. Yeah. And, you know, as I was making notes after, I was like, well, actually, there's a few holes here and there that could yeah. do with filling. And there's, you know, this and that issue that I have with it. So actually more like a three-star film if you actually think about it. However, yeah. it is a four-star experience. Like it's definitely a really fun watch it's a really good time um but i think it's it let it has a somehow shakier footing than the first film i think the first film is a solid you know it's probably a four and a half for me you know like i yeah. just like i really like the first film and this one not so much um it's you know like <laughs> the, the the smaller sibling you know who's kind of yeah. kind of dinky yeah so, I, I mean, I've pre-ordered the Blu-ray and I'm fairly sure I'll be able to put it on just at random intervals just to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. You know, I, think, yeah. um, I think I'll always get some enjoyment out of it. And who knows, maybe at some point I'll just skip to the fights because that's all I'm really there for. You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't know. Uh, the first one I can happily put on because I'm kind of captivated by everything about it. And, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's visually distinct. This one is less visually distinct. There's, yes. You know, I'm... I mean, I'm thinking, like, when I think back on the first one, which I've seen a load of times, I think about, you know, the, and I don't normally think about the, the visuals in such detail, but I think about all the colour, the use of colour, you know, the, the neon lit, uh, rainy aesthetic that's in the fight sequences and, and all this. And this is like, 
the fight sequences are in open daylight, which is, you know, it looks good, but kind of kind of generic-ish. Uh, there's a lot of stuff breaking, whatever, and like the locations look very bland as well. You know, mm. there's nothing about the Shattered Dome that feels real. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, do you know what in. it reminded me of? It really reminded me of Ender's Game, and I wonder if they use there's the same one, set. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if they use the same set for the Ender's Game Academy because, like the some of the rooms felt like I th- I think they seemed really similar, hmm. uh, and I haven't seen Ender's Game in some time. Uh, but I I Only really thought yeah. yeah I really it's thought enough. that it felt yeah well the the thing with Ender's Game that's a that's a different conversation to have. Um, <laughs> but it's 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 you know I think somebody skimmed the book that it was based on and just kind of you know kept certain elements and then ditched what's important about the book and that's why it was kind of forgettable by the end yeah. which is really a shame because it's it's a it's a classic science fiction book yeah. um but in any case to go back to yeah the, the genericness of this film in particular um I wanted to say something about the score the the soundtrack now the first the first film has an iconic soundtrack. Oh yeah. Um, you know, like it has that that Tom Morello guitar. Yeah. You know, the the Jaegers have their own melodies, their their own motifs that keep repeating whenever the Jaegers come on. Yeah. Um, there's you know like like the battle the battle music is you know in itself like it's it pumps you up you know like it's actually quite. Um, quite powerful and then this one i was listening to the soundtrack on my way back from the cinema and it's so generic and forgettable i can't tell you a single a single melody that stood out for me um you know and and it's composed by lauren balf who is himself a pretty big name in the soundtrack world but he's no Ramin Jawadi, and you can tell, you know, like the 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 best musical moment I thought in the film is the return of the original Pacific Rim theme, which is remixed by Patrick Stump of Fall Out Boy fame. Oh God, yeah, the um, remix was terrible. I I thought it was great. I was like, <laughs> ooh, ooh, this sounds this sounds like a like a Fall Out Boy song, and that's because yeah. it is. And, <laughs> like, you know, it's like, we we could have a Fall Out Boy song at the end of the credits, but then we didn't. Uh, it was just the Pacific Rim theme again, which, you know, hey, any excuse to listen to that, pretty much. It's on my self-esteem playlist. You know, like, you got to yeah. have some powerful guitar riffs. Um, it's great. Yeah, I wasn't uh, a fan of the remix. I didn't think it was... Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I didn't think it was edgy enough. You know, I, I really like how... Um, I don't know, edgy is the best word I can think of for it, but yeah. the, you know, the the theme in the first one, it does sound very kind of dangerous and uplifting, whereas that one, it just sounded like, yeah, whatever. You know, it's kind of, I, I thought that it blended, like, because I've listened to it a couple of times, you know, outside the film, it blends the original theme with, yeah. like, these electronic sounds that are definitely more 2018, like, they're yeah. very current, and that I think ties into what we said at the very beginning of the podcast about the demographic skewing younger. Yeah. Um, the, the idea that even the music is very much, you know, c- c- modern contemporary stuff, uh, synthy, poppy. It has a lot of like kind of a kind of a hip hop beat to it. Yeah. Um, kind of like an electronic like uh, uh, slant to the sound, which the original film definitely does not have. Um, you know, if the original film targeted people in their 20s, in their me- mid and late 20s, I would yeah. say, um, this film targets teenagers, like under 20. Yeah. And and the sound of the film, including, you know, the, the soundtrack and the, the kind of like poppy electronic theme, definitely factors into it, I think. Yeah, but they had an ch- opportunity to make this franchise sort of musically distinguishable with the kind of heavy metal sound in mm-hmm, the first one. Yeah. And, you know, it it, f- it fits wonderfully. Uh, yeah. Whereas in this one... It, it's a big yeah, shame. Yeah, I can't It's think a big, of... big shame that it doesn't... Yeah, and, and as you said, um, you know, the the design of it, you know, the cities and the and the Jaegers and the Shattered Dome, you know, the sets, you know, with, with the kind of genericness of the soundtrack itself, like it all just kind of creates yet another blockbustery type look, yeah. which, you know, is, is 
a step away. It's a few steps yeah. away from what made the original uh, the original really badass. Yeah. Um, and that's a shame. It's a, it's a big shame. Um, but and it just shows how talent can make something, you know, something that shouldn't necessarily work work mm. really well because yeah, you can you know, really tell this isn't yeah. Guillermo del Toro. Yeah, you can I really mean, really tell. What what you had was one of in the first one was one of the best. Um, one of the best visual storytellers out there making a pretty generic mm-hmm. action film, you know, and and him taking his hand to it elevates it to something that's far more memorable than it ever really should be. Yeah. Whereas this one, you've got Stephen S. Tonight, who, having directed only TV in the past, mm-hmm. you know, the TV directors don't tend to, certainly on network television, which is, other than Daredevil, which is where he kind of got his experience, mm-hmm. every episode has to look the same. Mm-hmm. You know, because it's, it's the same TV show. So therefore, what you've got is a production team that are making a TV show every week, doing most of the work. Mm-hmm. And then the director, I guess, handles the performances or different little choices here and there. Um, and I think maybe he doesn't know how to be a visual storyteller mm. coming into this film. So he just makes what he knows and, and just makes something that's like, yeah, anyone could have made this. You know, it yeah. feels like, it just feels Truly. like... You could have just given it to anyone; it would have been exactly the same. And I, I feel think, the same yeah, about... I think that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, they did kind of give it to anyone. Sorry to say, you know, unless yeah. it's Del Toro, it you know anyone else would have come in and made pretty yeah. much this movie. Yeah, I mean, even if you look at you know the Transformers movies, you can tell they're Michael Bay movies because Michael Bay is distinct. Whether you like right, that distinction yeah. or not, he is very distinct. You know, mm-hmm. all of his films have a distinct look to them. Um sunset all the time you know his sunsets last hours for instance because that's what he likes to shoot against um and if you think about spielberg's jurassic park versus trevorrow's jurassic park there's no comparison you know the the trevorrow one looks bland and uninteresting whereas the spielberg one is you know it looks great and uh, it's it's a good showing of that that's what talent can do to a film you know, mm. I think this franchise as it is now because there's two of them has proven that uh, it's all about, it can be all about the talent you put behind the, the camera to make the thing yeah because the script itself I mean I wonder if Del Toro had made the script it would have certainly looked a lot more interesting hmm yeah yeah absolutely yeah just a thought I mean I know I don't know an awful lot about how how these things come about, but you know, you can tell certain when certain films are made by certain people. Yeah, as a, yeah. as a viewer, and definitely, you know, it does have to do with the creative team that Del Toro likes to work with as well, not yeah. just himself, because he's not going to design absolutely everything about this film. You know, the cinematographer no. comes into play, the production design, all of these things. Um, he and definitely touches all those points as well. Yes, and his yeah. aesthetic does does influence the general look of the film, of course. And, yeah, him being just a producer on this definitely makes a difference um, in terms of that. Like, you can you can definitely tell visually um, that it's just, it's just not the same. Yeah. Uh, and that's something that I suppose we, we ex- expected. Uh, we, bo- we both kind of voiced that in the first podcast. We both said, you know, eh. I don't know about the look of this one, and it's it's and it's true, you know, like it does it does very much, um, you know, lack that distinct feel that made the first one what it was, um, and yeah, it is it is a bit a bit of a downgrade, um, yeah, yeah. Although I do want to see more from this franchise, you know, this hasn't put me off at all. Yeah, um, I'd watch I'd watch more of this absolutely. Yeah. Although, if they're going to go into the, the alternate universe, we really need Del Toro visually bringing that to life. Mm-hmm. You don't want just anyone doing that. Because you get a glimpse of it in the first film, and it's interesting because I watched the director's commentary long ago, and he was talking about how you know he uses colour and lighting to convey a world that's dying. Mm-hmm. And and when you think about it, you know, it's it's one of those um, visual things that you, you don't really think about, but when you, you know... It's, when you see it, it does look like it's dying, and he kind of put it into words for me. I was, like, but there mm-hmm. is a kind of bleakness to it, you know. The and it's obvious, or the very yeah, yeah, least, yeah, it looks course. different to the, the mm-hmm. rest of the film. So, 
I mean, what's it, yeah, what's it going to be like when they go there? Obviously, they'll have to flesh it out because you don't see much of it. So mm-hmm. are they just going to get there and it's going to be a generic rocky planet with purple sky or something like that? You know, but I'm thinking about Fantastic Four here or Fant Four Stick where they go to the other <laughs> planet and it <laughs> just looks like crap. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, we may never see this film, mm. um, but it could just be a CGI backdrop, alien planet, generic alien planet thing. Hmm, yeah. Unless it's just at the end of the film they go in or something, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I really wouldn't want to speculate now about where they'll take this, because who knows, maybe they'll have a brainstorming session, come up with 40 ideas, and then use all of them. <laughs> yeah. But the, the sting does suggest that. Yeah, we're going in. We're we're following yeah. you. Yeah. 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 It'd be interesting to see. Um, it'd be interesting to, to to see what they will do. You know, in terms of we've just been on the defensive, as as Earth. You know, we've we've built these robots and fought them off, and you know, like we have not been on the offensive yeah. at all with this with this, this alien war thing, and. You know what? What are they going to build? How are they going to fight it? More Jaegers? Like obviously, <laughs> if if there's bigger and worse kaiju's out there, or you know, if the precursors themselves are stronger, then we yeah. have a problem. Um, but yeah, that's that's a, I suppose a headache for a different team to figure <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah, funnily enough, it has a similar ending to Independence Day two as well, because mm-hmm. that ends with we're going after them as well so yeah. I don't know were they mm-hmm. just was there some influence I mean that's a weird film to copy <laughs> <laughs> well perhaps perhaps yeah it's not that bad actually I don't think it's that bad I think it's just kind of forgettable but um, apart from Brent Spiner being amazing you know it's without going into the Independence Day 2 podcast he's like I'm in a blockbuster <laughs> in 2017 like, or 2016 or whenever year it came out and he's just loving every second of it as he should. <laughs> um, yeah. So, do you think John yeah. Boyega would come back for a sequel? Maybe. Maybe he's contractually obligated to. You know. Um, I think it will depend on the, the scheduling and money. Um, what really makes me sad is that the reason there's no Raleigh Beckett in this is because Hunnam was filming that terrible King Arthur film that, that a what it was? flopped at the. Yeah, he was filming King Arthur, and oh. A, that was terrible, and B, it didn't even do well at the box office, you know, enough to warrant him, like, missing Pacific Rim 2, <laughs> so, like, I bet he's kicking himself now. He's like, well, I really wish I hadn't done that, but I suppose it's been done now. Um, it's 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 a shame. It's a real shame that, you know, King Arthur, King Arthur, <laughs> come on. Anyway, um, don't don't get me started on that. I'll you know, that's a different podcast entirely. Um, yeah, I haven't seen it. But, uh... Yeah. Oh, neither have I. I've seen I've seen bits of it. And it's so bad. I don't even want to. It's, yeah. you know, ugh. anyway. Um, yeah. Ultimately, with with John Boyega, I hope that, you know, w- w- whatever other obligations he picks up in the meantime, because who knows how many years they'll take making the next one, you <laughs> yeah. know? Another eight um, years, yeah. Yeah, who knows, you know? Yeah. I'm I'm not I'm not fully expecting any of this to take a short time. Um, and if in the middle of all of that, Boyega picks up other projects, we'll see what happens. Um, I hope he sticks around, because I think he can carry it. Yeah. Um, and he's really fun to watch, and I did like his character. Um, we'll see. I wonder what role Charlie Hunnam would have had in this hypothetical version. You know, it would have been a very different film because he doesn't slot into any of the characters that you have. Hmm. You know, unless he's the marshal and gets killed. You <laughs> know, at the point that marshal gets killed. You know, the the marshal. Hmm. I can't remember his name. He's just. You know. The Chinese guy? Yes, I don't yeah. remember his name either. He gets killed right after he says the words Pacific Rim, though. It's almost as if the, the <laughs> drones were like, nope, nope, that's it. You, you have to die. You, you said the, the title of the film. Uh, yes. Yeah, the, I guess that's the only role he could have been in, though, is the, is the Marshall type hmm. role, because himself being a Jaeger pilot, you know, I suppose you'd have to have Mako there, and then 
you, you no, I don't think so. I, I, you know, I, I was trying to think the entire film. I was like, where is Raleigh right now? If he is alive, he yeah. is not involved with the Pan Pacific Defense Corps because he's not there. Yeah. He, um, th- th- you know, I mean, he has been known to drop off the grid. Like, what would lead him to drop to off the again. grid? Yeah. You know, yeah, he's, he's just kind of like, you know, living a vagrant life somewhere. Like, what's, you know, what could possibly have, you know, perhaps, you know, him, him and Mako maybe had a fight or like, they're not, they're not getting along for whatever reason. Like, I can't, I, I can't think of what, you know, would be a justifiable reason for him to not be there. Yeah. Um, and that does bug me. Other and being if, dead, of course. Unless, yeah, ex- exactly. <laughs> um, you know, that I'll, I'll accept, obviously, but if you know if he's alive i just don't understand uh why he wouldn't be there um you know it's it's a pretty big thing to be missing yeah yeah i don't know yeah, yeah he we'll see i doesn't... suppose what they yeah. decide to do in the third one if there is a third <laughs> if it one. ever exists yeah yeah if if not it's a it's a fan fiction with cardboard boxes that we're making yes seriously that's <laughs> that's what i'm picturing i'm just picturing raleigh like just like not giving a toss, you know. He's just somewhere like <laughs> maybe on an island. Maybe it's not a cardboard box. Maybe he's you know living his best life. Yeah. Somewhere else. No, no meaning if <laughs> in they the don't Caribbean. Make a, <laughs> if they don't make a, a third film, then we will do a fan fiction version where we use cardboard boxes as Jaeger suits. I would watch that. <laughs> <laughs> after after making it, you would watch it. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I would make that like, and then watch it. Yeah, it'd be the Swedish version of, of Pacific Rim, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, it'd be cool. Very uh, low tech. Yeah, low tech is it's fine. Yes. It, it, it'd, be make, it'd make up for it in story, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I don't think there's anything else to say about the film. I mean, yeah, I yeah, I've, else to I've say covered about no, I've covered all of my notes. That's everything yeah. that I have thoughts on. Yeah. Uh, I don't have anything else. I mean, yeah. Covered An interesting most of the note on fan fiction. Um, apparently, um, Charlie Day, uh, in the downtime between the two films, has been reading Newton Geisler fan fiction <laughs> and using it as inspiration. And so that you know, take that and you know, chew on it. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. I'm not even sure what. Yeah. That, that that must be a weird thing for an actor to read fan fiction about a character you play because a lot of time that's not a can of worms you want to open. <laughs> and yet I'm I'm kind of I'm like really positively surprised by this by this revelation. You know, like here he is, <laughs> you know, like actual professional actor, and he's like he I think he said you know that he was thankful for the people who like have been producing content this entire time. Yeah. Um, about his character, and you know, it's if there's anything to say about fandom is that you know often there there is a very cohesive vision that emerges within a fandom about a character, yeah. and so everyone ends up kind of writing the character the same way. Yeah, and that's you know so interesting that he would you know read that, see it as inspirational, and go yes, you know, like that's great, like that's how I'm going to play him. That's awesome to me that's that's really great yeah except from all the the outlandish slash fiction that moves things around just so that certain oh no he actually he actually (laughs) said that he uh read newton herman fan fiction and that he (laughs) that's how he played it he played it that you know that was a thing um i want to go back and watch the film again now and see if that is in his performance like i just really yeah i want i want to see it (laughs) but that's just me though i'm I'm well, there for that kind of thing. If we want a third one, we have to go and see it ten times each. You know, like just <laughs> everyone who likes the Pacific Rim franchise, even if you didn't like this one as much, if yeah. you want more of it. Give it as much as <laughs> yeah, yeah, as much as you can. Yeah, those yeah. with unlimited cars just book screenings and go. Don't go. Fine. <laughs> you know, you <laughs> inflate the box office as much as you can, and there'll be more of it. <laughs> Buy the Blu-ray. You know, it'll be like the the Firefly campaign. Where where everyone was buying ten copies of the blue the DVDs, yeah, just to just to try and get it back, but uh, whatever works, <laughs> yeah, it, it worked for that. So got it, got it a film. Yeah, so fair enough. Yeah, 
Um, it's all good. So yeah, uh, I think we've exhausted this film as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, more depth than it deserves, perhaps, as a discussion. <laughs> but perhaps, perhaps. <laughs> but I don't know. I think it's been worthwhile. Uh, mm. it's, it's a franchise, and it can now call it a franchise that, that I like. So, um, oh wow, well, the budget was one hundred and fifty million. That's that's sizable. According to IMDb, it's mm. like wow. Well, that's weird for a modest success, a sequel to a mo- film that was a modest success. Hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, it, I don't think it's making that back very anytime soon, but we'll see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, do you have any wrap up thoughts to to leave on other than Charlie Day reading? <laughs> Well, ultimately, explicit fan fiction. <laughs> ultimately, I'm going to say, you know, I had a good time watching this film. You know, I know that we did rip it to shreds a little bit um, That's over what we the do course this of this yeah, over the course of this podcast. You know, we we did we did kind of find perhaps a few a few more holes than than we we originally did while watching the film. Um, I'm going to say, you know, it's a good time. It's fun. It's you know. Perhaps generic, perhaps, you know, a little forgettable, but, you know, there is a time and a place for films that, you know, are good for those two hours that you watch them. So, yeah. you know, this definitely falls within that category. It does build on existing mythology and world building and character quite nicely. Um, yes, th- there's a lot more they could be doing, and perhaps they have the intention. Perhaps there will be more expanded universe stuff. Who knows? I'm into it. I'll yeah. I'll read the the expansion novel. I'll read the the comic books. I'll you know yes, give me. I'm I'm game. Um, but yeah, ultimately yes, it is it is worth watching. Uh, it is worth owning. It's you know as you said you know you can put it up in the background you know on a day that you just want some entertainment. That's yeah. fine. Um, yeah, overall I had a good time. I'm the same. I had a good time with it. It's it's good fun. It's a good time at the movies. You know, it's it does feel like a cinematic experience. You know, mm. it's, um, how many of those films are you thinking? Can you think of where you go to the cinema to see them, but you think I would have probably liked this better if I was sitting at home? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and it's not one of those. It's you know, I saw it in IMAX, and I was like, yeah, this is this is how I'm supposed to experience this. I think you know, I don't think there's, uh, I don't think you would get the same out of it even watching it and just watching it at home or whatever i think it's yeah it's definitely worth seeing in the on the big screen for sure yeah so and it's kind of the graphics the graphics are next level they're so good and it's i guess it's almost a bit of a palate cleanser before we hit the the big blockbusters of the year you know you've got your yeah you've got your avengers coming up you've got star wars coming up you've you know no one gives a crap about the solo film but um or at least I yeah. certainly don't. You know, that's, no, was, that's true. I don't. I don't know anybody who seriously does. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. So no one gives a crap about that. But you know, you've got a lot of big films coming up, and it's almost mm-hmm. a bit of a. It's it's a nice little introduction to that. You know, here's a nice breezy one to get you started, get you into the high octane action fueled stuff. Uh, you know, maybe maybe we'll give you the smarter one with Avengers next month. Who knows? I haven't seen it yet, so who who knows? But maybe that'll <laughs> be a better. Maybe that'll be a kind of wow. That blew my mind, and it was actually really thought provoking at the same time. So, uh, who knows? We shall who knows? See. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, good start to the blockbuster season. I think it you can almost count it as a start because I mean there've been other blockbuster a things, but not really. Um, you know, a wrinkle in time, I suppose, is considered a blockbuster. Which is I like, suppose, but yeah. really, in the in the shadow of Infinity War. I think everything else kind of cowers next to it right now. Yeah, definitely. And Ready Player One? Uh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. I was going to go see it today before Pacific Rim, but then I was like, actually, I don't really feel like it. I've read the book and I didn't particularly like it. So, yeah, yeah like I'm, I'm not expecting to like this film either and after hearing what you had to say about it as well i'm yeah not super keen (laughs) (laughs) there could be a ready player one podcast relatively soon i don't know depends on Hmm. time there's not enough time for everything i want to do but (laughs) so yes uh so thank you for drifting um, (laughs) and drifting with me for this possibly final pacific rim podcast the the final one we ever do yeah (laughs) 
Yeah, well, if there's no more of it, you know, we'll just come yeah. back and talk about the first one again. Just I, as I said before, I'm down. <laughs> yeah, and here's another two hours about the same thing. And surprisingly, the conversation doesn't overlap somehow. <laughs> so yeah, uh, thanks for thanks for drifting and thanks for honouring the legacy of this franchise. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. That was our discussion on Pacific Rim Uprising. Thanks to YouTuber Little V Mills for the supplied music. If you like what you heard, then hit subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, or any major podcasting app. And join us on the next Neil Before Pod. (laughs) 